this court can you the truth, the whole truth, but the truth said God. Sir, would you please state the name? Christopher James Palmer. It's been a uh, it's been a difficult time, I place. Yes. Uh, this is your opportunity to tell your story. My no. This is your opportunity to tell your story. Are, are you ready to tell these people what happened? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, if you need to take breaks. Take a pause and just let me know. Okay? Yes. All right. <clears throat> just tell these people the truth. <clears throat> Did you harm Madeline Kochikari? No. Do you know where Madeline Kochikari is? No. Did you know that Madeline Kochikari was missing? No. Before you went to the school? No. <clears throat> so how old are you, sir? Uh, it's 60 years old. Uh, June. Okay. <clears throat> Is it okay if I call you Chris? Yes. All right, Chris, tell us a little about yourself. Um, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. Okay. And what did your parents do? Uh, my dad was a uh, in, um, design draftsman at uh, General Motors. My mother stayed home and took care of a lot of kids. A lot of kids. How, how many kids is a lot of kids? Um, seven boys, four girls. Wow. That's a lot. What was that like? Well, as you know, um, I just always had younger ones below me, older ones above me. So I kind of hung in both, both groups. And are you close with your family? Yes. What did you do for work? Uh, my last job was at General Dynamics in the Huntsville, North Carolina. And what do you do for General Dynamics? I was a design draftsman with my father. Uh, I did mechanical designs, um, drafted. Um, mechanical parts, um, the specifications of the engineers. Sure. Mr. Clerk, um, yeah, may I, may I pursue? Please. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, uh, I'm approaching with parts with what's marked as Defense Exhibit C. Mr. Palmer, would you teach, please take a look at that document? So, uh, how long have you worked for General Dynamics? I worked two and a half years contract, um, contracted to General Dynamics, and a few months I went direct from 
from a September time frame to November. And what location do you work at? Where Where is your office? Where, where is it's in the Plainsville, North Carolina, on the um, other side of Greensboro. It's on the other side of Greensboro. Uh, how long does it take you to drive to work? Hour and a half. And you're out of the to admit defense exhibit R. Any objection? Uh, yeah. Okay. Permission. Permission to publish. Top left ball. Chris, so that's the, uh, this is the route that you typically take to work. It's one of two routes, I guess. I don't know how to this way. And uh, what is your address? Um, on 812 and 352 Bay Drive, from the North Carolina. Okay. And so, when you drive to work, that's that's an hour and a half each way. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, can you tell us about what your um, Typical work schedule is? Uh, this is a nine hour day. Um, eight, eight in the morning till five, or until I complete a nine hour shift. And um, what, do you, what do you do for general dynamics? I design mechanical uh, components. Um, for their a military contractor, so they do a lot of needed work to, for uh, undersea communications. Do you have to have any type of special security clearance to do that? Yes. And so tell us about the uh, tell us about the building. Is there anything special about the building that you're in? Uh, we're on the I think it's the second floor and the exterior of the building is a cinder block with glass windows and our design room is inside of those um, cinder blocks so there's additional walls uh, and doors 
what if any security is there for electronic <coughs> communications coming in out of the Coming in? Or going out? Right. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, if I'm getting phone calls, a lot of times the phone calls and emails, a lot of times the center block walls will, um, the, the communication will come in. And if I'm expecting a, a phone call or a um, email, I'll actually have to go outside and reload, remove my phone, and then look into email or and I would be able to call. So it's a cumbersome task. <clears throat> so, to put it in layman's terms, what's the reception like in that place? Yeah, it's not very good. Okay. Are you able to get phone calls in there? Um, phone calls um, is hit or miss sometimes if it is, if it's it What about text messages? Uh, text messages seem to come in okay. And, Tell us about uh, any hobbies you have. Hobbies you have. Hobbies. Um, I have a side business, uh, laser engraving, so CO2 laser. Um, size of a really large printer, and I can cut um, and engrave um, projects that are 12 by 24 inches and up to seven or eight inches thick. And what type of things do you make with that engraving? Um, I have um, a lot of military clients, people that are retired from the Marines, Army. Um, I have um, some specific um, groups, Boy Scouts of America, that I work with. And um, a whole lot of, you know, just regular customers that just contact me, um, real estate, contact me um, and have me uh, create some designs for them. Yes, Your Honor, I'd ask to be heard. The appropriate here.
Mr. Clerk, please. All right, Chris. So you said that um, we have a, a side business doing laser engraving, is that right? Yes. And is this representative of the type of projects that you would do with that machine? Yes. You'd make like boxes and engrave images on them. And, uh, and what other types of things would you engrave images on? Um, wood, glass, um, plastic, acrylic, stainless steel, carbon steel. And what type of uh, what type of machine do you use to to make these types of things? It looks pretty cool. What do you do? It's a CO two laser. Um, um, works with my computer. I just create the designs of the computer and send them to the laser creator. This uh, is this part of those apparatuses that you would use to to make those kinds of things. Yes, this is my laser creator machine. Okay. And um, how much does one of those cost? That one was about eight thousand dollars. You have you have more than one? I have one.
Mr. Kirk, if you would please. So you would um, you would take pictures of things to remember to remember to do what? Can you explain? If I'm going to the store, um, something that I want to buy, or if I'm in the store, I would take a picture of it to like like this, look it up. Possibly buy it on Amazon if it's cheaper than it is in the store. So even things like deodorant. Yes. So you took a picture of deodorant on December 5th? Yes. What is, what is this? Uh, this is hair gel. Hair gel. Okay. And you took a picture of hair gel also on December 5th? Yes. What is this item? That's conditioner. And you took a picture of conditioner. Yeah, it's hard to find this <laughs> On December 1st? Yes. What is this? Toothpaste. Toothpaste. Is it good toothpaste? Yeah, pretty good. And you took a picture of this on December 5th? Yes. And sometimes the things that you try to remember are pretty mundane. Is that fair to say? Yes. What is this? That is a battery. What does the battery go to? Uh, it looks like it's my garage door opener. Which is on the right hand side of the picture. Ah, okay. That's what that is on the right. And you took a picture of that on December 10th? Yes. Last one. We won't go through everything on the phone. What is this? That is a fast water heater for coffee or tea. Um, it was broken, so it's going to try and find another one. Pretty close. And you took a picture of that on December 9th? Yes. Thank you. So let's talk about your relationship with Diana Kochikar. Okay. Is that going to be difficult for you? Mm -hmm. We'll see. <laughs> if, you need, if, if you get emotional, like I said, just, it's fine. Okay? Don't be embarrassed. It'll be okay. Um, so tell us, tell us about how you met Diana. Um, I met Diana on an online dating slash writing site. Uh, can you tell us the name of that website? Yeah, it was called Global Ladies. Okay. And um, when uh, did you do that? I think it was in the 2008 time frame. And um, what did uh, what did Diana represent herself to be? Um, a single woman born in 1979. She was a teacher. Spoke. You know, she graded herself on her English. Said, um, speak and understands enough without an interpreter. And did you um, communicate back and forth with her? Yes, for probably a year, maybe two, okay. before we actually met. Okay, so when's the first time that you actually met? Um, probably two years later. Okay. And how, where, where did you meet? Let me put it that way. Uh, first, we shared our regular emails, so we communicate back and forth. And we met in Kishinau, um, uh, Moldova. Okay. And the, the first time 
you met her, was she still single? <coughs> yes. Okay. And um, on that first encounter with her, uh, how did that go? It went well. We just went to dinner. Um, she's a teacher, so she was kind of like my guide to the scenes and parts and art and things of that nature. Did you um, make any future plans with her that first time that you met her in Moldova? Um, I don't recall, but there there was a promise from, um, I think, in a later trip okay. there. So, um, tell us tell us about the promise ring and the later trip. When about did that happen? Um, well, things were going well on the first trip, and we we agreed that we wanted to see each other more. Um, so I had planned a second trip, and through our letters, things were progressing nicely. Um, so I planned that trip, and I, I took a promise ring with me, not to propose, but just to basically say, you know, there's a potential uh, future and that's what the promise ring represented. Okay. And did did everything go well from there, or were there any issues? It did, but it, it, it did. Um, by the time we decided we wanted to proceed with an engagement, um, there was a lengthy returning process to get her a T1 visa so she could come here to the United States. Okay. And um, now, when did she come to the United, to the United States? It, uh, she and Madalena, uh, Madalena at that time, it was maybe four, three or four. Um, they came here in December of 2015. Okay, well let's back that up because I, I feel like, you're, I feel like you, you skipped a step there because you went to go meet Diana in Moldova, right? Like around, I think you said around 2008 or so? Yeah. Okay. But um, you are not Madeline and Coach Carr's biological father. No, there was a point in time where communication stopped um, after the first trip. Okay. There, was a, there was a gap in our communication. And I figured she just moved on or something like that. And later, um, I tried to reach out multiple times. I think she finally did reach out, um, responded back to me, and told me that uh, she had gotten pregnant with um, a local man. And he didn't want anything to do with her, so um, she contacted me. Um, just to say, I'm still out here. I don't know if you're still interested or not. But, um, and then she, with pictures, uh, introduced me to um, pictures um, of her and that only together. Uh, and that only was one or two years old. <coughs> All right. So let me get let me get that straight. So you met Diana online. And you talked with her for a few years through messaging. Correct. And then you traveled to Moldova. Yes. And then you gave her a promise. Ring. Yes. And after you had done that, she had a sexual relationship with another man. No. Um, well, that was she, before the promise. Ring. You, you went. Yeah. She she had the relationship prior to the promise. Ring. Okay. Yeah. But it was after you had went to Moldova and met with her and made plans. Yes. Okay. So how did that how did that make you feel when you were supposed to be making plans together and then she went and had a sexual relationship with another man? Uh, at first I just looked at it like um, 
that that potential was not, that wasn't a potential anymore. But then she expressed interest, so, so I, um, uh, we proceeded to communicate for a while. And when she reached back out to you, she had uh, Madeline. Madeline was her daughter, right? Yes. Okay. And did she represent to you that she wanted to come to the United States? I mean, this really the whole idea of the, the dating site is that they're looking to connect with somebody. So she understood and she told me her, she explained to her family, her father and mother, that that's what she wanted to do and they supported her in that decision. Uh, and how did she tell you she was? Well, her profile said she was born in 1979. Okay. And then, uh, so the, she would have been, how old was she on uh, on the profile that you were viewing? How old did she say she was? Uh, it didn't give an age, it just gave a birthday. Just a birthday, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, <clears throat> When you came back to the United States, when when did she come back to the United States to be with you? In uh, the end of 2015, in December, the middle of December, <coughs> December 17th or something like that, close to Christmas. Okay. And did you end up getting married? Yes. And in the process, uh, tell us about the process of getting married. What do you got to do to get married? Um, she, with the attorney that we had, um, to get her over here with a K-1 visa, you have 90 days to get married or she has to return to her own country. So we got married, um, uh, January, I believe it was January 9th of, um, 2016. And in order to do that, did you have to apply for a marriage license? Yes. Okay. What did you learn about Diana Kotakari when you went to get the marriage license? I found out that she was actually born in 1985. Okay. So she had lied to you about how old she was? Yes. And uh, you ended up, you, you still got married? I don't know, Jack, just to the basis of knowledge as far as coming up for the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, tell us about uh, Diana's personality. Uh, even when we met in Moldova, she's very spiritual. Um, that's why age did not, she said age did not matter to her. Her parents didn't seem to have a problem with it because that was her decision. Um, I know there's a little bit of spirituality when I was over there in Moldova, but um, it seemed to be progressively increasing as time went on. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that. Okay. Um, <coughs> when you first met her in Moldova, can you describe the spirituality that you were talking about? Um, we were actually at a um, little cafe, and she told me that um, she had a message um, from, I guess she speaks with angels, and they told her that she would meet somebody from America. I don't know if they said a name, but... And that was, that was her, um, I guess, download that the guy from America is the one you're going to be with. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, did you notice about 
of her religious practices when you first met her? When I first met her, the Russian Orthodox, um, they, and her, she and her family would um, go to the Russian Orthodox Church, um, which she pointed out to me when I visited her. Um, but then she started studying other religions and was interested in the dynamics of other religions. Not that one, one religion was the, the only thing. Did anything strike you as off about her when you met her in Moldova? In Moldova? Mm -hmm. No. And so... Um, other than, I'm sorry to interrupt, other than when she told me that she was informed um, by whoever she communicates with spiritually that the one from America would be the, uh, the one that she would choose. She told you that she got that message from angels. I don't remember exactly how she said it, but later on, I figured that's that's how it came about. Okay. So, from what you're saying, is that you kind of dismissed that as just being religious, or? Yeah, I did. Um, she told me she was she was in a prayer group there in Moldova. And they they prayed a lot together, went to church together, um, all from them together. <coughs> who had, you know, little social get-togethers. <clears throat> and um, what was your relationship like with Diana when she first came in 2017? What was it like? Uh, it was really good. Um, uh, Madalena, I don't think, spoke much English. Um, she understood Diana and Romanian. Um, so Diana would, would spend the nights with Madalena for the comfort of her, so she's comfortable in a new country. Okay. That seems reasonable, right? Yeah. Uh, protective? Mm -hmm. You didn't think anything was unusual about that? No. Okay. And um, at that point in time, how was she uh, with Madalena? Very good. Yeah, she's a very protective mother. And then, um, as time went on, um, let's just say from 2017 to 2020, mm -hmm. what was your relationship like with Diana from 2017 to 2020? Um, her relationship with Diana, it was, um, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, it's my first marriage. Uh, the couple dynamic, and then one with a little girl. It was all new to me. Well, and that, that brings me to something I, I forgot to ask you about. Um, so, have you never been married before? No. Okay. So, how old were you when you married Diana? Summer fling. Uh, did 
did you have any serious relationship before you met Diana Kutchkar? Not serious. I had one date with a girl in, in college, and then um, we lost contact. And you have no other children? No. <clears throat> And so going back to uh, Diana's, pers Diana's personality, in 20, between 2017, 2020, 2021, um, what, if anything, did you notice about um, her as a mother during that time frame? Her as a mother? Um, she was very protective and attentive to Madalena. Um, uh, she prayed a lot. So during those times, she, I guess, maybe wasn't as attentive to Madalena because she's praying, but Madalena was included in some of the prayers. So um, I guess you could say she was attentive to her then as well. Tell us about the prayers that she was doing. Well, she was listening to a an older, she's probably from the 70s, uh, woman that they, they created a church in, I think, Utah or somewhere like that. And um, Diana would follow her teachings um, and her prayers. What was this person's name? Her name was Elizabeth Clark Crowd. Okay. And um, in following those teachings, um, did you, what if anything unusual did you notice between 2017 and 2021? There, there was a lot of, like, I don't know how to ex uh, explain it. It was like chanting when they pray, they, they pray really fast, and the faster you pray, the more times you get a prayer in, the more extra credit you get. Okay. And um, did that, what did you think about that? Um, I thought it was uh, strange. Uh, she actually involved myself and Madalena in those prayers. We would actually... Um, we didn't have the TV, but we, um, uh, she would find YouTube videos of Elizabeth Clark Prophet, and we would say the prayers, the chants, the um, uh, meditations. Um, this time, all this time, uh, well, <laughs> separate that. At that point in time, did you um, sleep in, what, at what point in time did you sleep in the same room with Diana? With that? Um, we, we slept in the same room maybe in a year, but um, I'm a guy, I snore, and I have early working hours, and she either didn't want, she wanted me to be fresh for work, or she didn't like the snoring, so she actually moved uh, she actually moved into, uh, she, I moved into, she slept on the additional bed that Madalena had under her bed. Um, there's a sort of trundle that you just saw. So you both stopped sleeping in the same room around what time? You got married in 2017. Yeah. When did you uh, stop sleeping in the same room? Maybe 2018. And um, during this time frame, um, what was your romantic relationship like with Diana Kutchkar? Mm, our romantic relationship was mostly spiritual. <coughs> okay. Um, we were never romantic, uh, peck on the cheek or kiss on the lips, maybe on a birthday. Okay, on her birthday. What's that? She, she, she would give you a, a peck on the cheek on a birthday? Maybe. I mean, I, I think I would kiss her on the lips on a birthday. Okay. Or for Christmas, thank you for the gift kind of thing. Okay. Um, what about other times? It was usually, when I would go to bed, I would just 
say goodnight to her. She would turn and she kiss her and she. Were you ever physically intimate with Diana Kujikar? No. Never? Never. So from the time you got married, you needed to make something. And um, was there any um, domestic violence in the house? No. Uh, so, would you describe would you describe your relationship with her as more of a companionship? Yeah. Yeah, companionship. Uh, I was trying to learn the spiritual end of it so we could communicate better. Wait, and when you say communicate better, can you expound on that for us? Um, she was um, so into her praying meditation that I felt that if I learned the the meditations or the spiritual end of it, uh, we would have a more even keeled relationship because that would be something that we'd have in common. Um, she was pretty advanced. I tried to learn it, but she always told me that this is just something you have to learn on your own. Okay. Now, you had, you had mentioned earlier that um, she was teaching Madalena this spiritual practice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, she would um, turn on these, uh, get the computer, put on Elizabeth Clare Prophet, and, and Madalena would say the um, meditations, prayers, chants, whatever, and they got progressively faster. Um, some of them were quite advanced. Dr. was pretty fast with it. Um, but and sometimes I think Madalena was faster. It's almost like a competition with her. Um, did Diana uh, did Diana work in there? Um, that's really you know, She talked about getting a job. She wanted to create a YouTube business. Actually, she wanted Madalena to create her YouTube business as well. Um, not only the light, um, these little girl videos where they unbox dolls and horses and stuff. And Madeline watched it so much, she knew, she knew exactly what to say and how to do it. Diana thought that she would be really good at it. So to summarize what you just said, Diana didn't have a job anymore. That's right. Okay. So, um, Diana, would she be at home? Yes. During that? Yes. Okay. So, um, what type of work were you doing um, from 2017 to 2020? Yeah, um, I was working at Ingersoll Rand, um, a uh, tool company in Davidson, uh, North Carolina. Designing um, uh, fluid pumps. Okay. And uh, how many hours a week do you, did you normally work at that job? It was a 40 hour week. It was 12 minutes to work. Okay. So a lot closer. Yes. Um, who was responsible for um, caring? Caring for Maddie, can we call her Maddie? Is that okay? Yeah, that we we call her Maddie. And Matt, Maddie actually liked her full name, Madalena. Mm -hmm. um, she actually corrected some kids at school. Right. One 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 time, the someone called her Madalena, and she got a little upset. Um. So, who was responsible for? for her day-to-day -day care. Can you tell us like how the household works? Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, um, I'd go to work. Uh, Diana um, would make sure that um, Madeline got up in, up in time for school. Um, um, she was trying to get Madeline to pack her own lunch. Um, she uh, made sure that Madeline took a bath uh, before she went to bed at night. Uh, she was 100% in charge of Madeline's education, development, the whole thing. And um, going back, just talking about that time frame, how would you describe your, your family life from 2017 to 2021? Um, I mean, it was, um, A lot of it, a lot of my attention was on Madalena. Um, her mother uh, seemed to be um, doing her prayers a lot, and Madalena would always ask me to play with her. I never turned her down.
uh, experience. And then she also say um, medications or some chairs when she was doing it. Um, and then Madeline is turned in the chair. Um, she did the same thing. Um, she was putting the heat into whatever you want to call it. And uh, what about what about burning things? Did you ever burn things? Yes. Can you describe that for us? Um, we had a fire pit in the upper area of our yard, just a hill, and I built a fire pit back there for burning like you know, some woods and sticks and stuff like that. We actually roasted marshmallows back there. But over time, the, the burning got, you know, she would burn like cat boxes up there and other things. Um, but it progressed to be things that are even burnable, like stainless steel travel ones and little racks for holding papers that are made of metal. And, uh, a coat rack is made of metal. Um, I, I went out there the next day to look what was in it, and all the things that were in the fire pit, they don't even. She must have put wood in there to burn with it, because um, they're not they're not burnable. Um, other things she was burning papers. With her writing suit, she she had notebooks that she wrote in. She burned those, um, but she usually burned those in a like a room of pot, like the one that you cook a turkey in. Um, she would just put some butter fluid in the bottom. Okay, so for how many how many years was she burning things in the house? Um, I just noticed like in 2022, maybe a little bit earlier, I don't quite recall. Um, the burning things that you know makes you raise your eyebrow. But I mean, we typically burn things. Um, you know, um, of all the stuff that I create with wood, I have scrap wood. And we would just burn stuff in the fire pit and um, just kind of tend the fire. But then over time, the, the burnings got to be um, things that made me raise my eyebrows. But that was later in 2022. Um, tell us about uh, tell us about the the prayer activities. What would she have you do as part of these prayer activities? If um, she would have like a, a group or a family meeting slash um, prayer session, and she would generally lead it. And she would. Um, Look up on YouTube um, um, prayers. They were generally from the Elizabeth Clare Prophet series. Um, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of them. And um, before we go too far forward into 2022. You want me to approach with me? Mr. Clark, I'm handing Mr. Palmer. Let's mark the defendant's exhibit. 
B1 through B14. Mr. Palmer, if you would please take a look at that for me. Yeah, Chris, come on. Thank you, Your Honor. 